I knew I didn't want to go to university. When he heard this, Pa was relieved. University's not for you, Harry, he said. My tutor at Eton agreed heartily. You're not a bookish lad, and that's fine, he said. Gosh, no, there's nowhere I'd less rather be than a rotten old library. Books put me to sleep. I mean, like total Yonsville. Nevertheless, as a royal, there is a good chance that one day you'll be requested to write a book on some subject or other close to your heart, my tutor reflected. At this moment, shafts of golden sunlight were blazing through the ornate windows, alighting on the Eton master's coiffed silver locks. He fluffed out his gown, which bloomed with slow grace, like the sail of a dow upon the waters of the Nile, catching the first ominous breath of a Sirocco, the desert wind. If this occurs, the chances are you will have to work with a ghostwriter, quoth the pedagogue, his features shifting contemplatively so that he took on a majestic cast, half Rembrandt self portrait, half ponderous. Agamemnon, dispensing fatherly advice to impetuous Achilles. That was a mouthful. When the time comes, try not to pick one who overwrites like a bloody ponce and makes it perfectly obvious you haven't written a word of the book just so he can advertise his own sorry arse for future work. I shall endeavor to follow your advice assiduously, master. I asseverated, and bowing deeply, I withdrew to play rugger on those fields of Eton, whereon the Duke of Wellington famously declared the Battle of Waterloo had been won. Little did I know that my own Battle of Waterloo lay in the future, and in this case, Napoleon would come in the form of betrayal from within my own. Family. Chapter 19. I got a call from someone in the palace. There's a story about to break, they said. Are you taking cocaine, Harry? Is it true? My God, really? You would ask me that? Really? You mean it's not true? I am completely revolted by the insinuation, I said. The very thought. How do these abhorrent scandal mongers get away with peddling this rubbish? Okay then, I'll deny it. I thanked him. I was utterly dejected at my treatment by the press. In fact, so much so that I decided a little line was in order, just to take the edge off. Chapter 20 Pa took me on a royal trip to South Africa. We were to appear in public alongside Nelson Mandela and the Spice Girls. Many people were overawed to find themselves in front of such majesty and humanity and became speechless when coming face to face with the most adored, most worshipped presence on the planet. Of course, I had been around famous people all my life, so I took meeting the Spice Girls in my stride. Sure you did, Harry. And there we go again with his belt and khaki shorts. They were remorselessly upbeat, happy, positive, and outgoing. Spice up your life, they sang. But I did not want to spice up my life. My life was already a vendaloo. I wanted to be a korma, a pasanda, or even better, an omelette and chips. Sorry, Mr. Currywhite waiter, vendaloo is just not my thing. And also sorry for all the historical nick in your country stuff. Little did I know that in due course my life would turn from a vindaloo to a fowl. A fowl is the curry that's hotter than a vindaloo. And I would find that fowl from ideal. Oh my gosh. <laughs> that sounds like a pun that Harry would definitely make. And I would suffer a fall from grace. My temperature would rise so much that I would need a falmometer. <laughs> Please cut this bit, Harry. When I heard the news, I was speechless with horror. It seemed that my mother's former butler had published a sensational tell all memoir, giving the inside story of a side of events and allowing prying eyes to set foot, if prying eyes can set feet, and I imagine they might be able to, within the palace walls. It was disgusting. 
This feels like a very accurate Harry train of thought, don't you think? That a trusted personage at the heart of the family should go outside and sell all the tawdry details at his disposal to the highest bidder, and then go on talk shows around the world to brag about it. None of us could countenance the betrayal. It was unconscionable. It was hypocrisy of the highest order. Yeah, he can look in a mirror. We were all so angry, we wanted to have the men hanged, drawn, and quartered, or halved, at the very least. In the end, we had to content ourselves with knowing that the man was just an attention seeker, trying to get a few quick quid by selling his soul to the book publisher with the fattest checkbook. The idea made my blood run cold. Hey, yep, they could... He could have been talking for a spare for all I knew. Chapter 22 It was a party to celebrate Granny's Golden Jubilee. All of the United Kingdom went wild. There were people dancing in the street, holding block parties, which in, Bear, which in Britain are called street parties, and congregating with ebullient joy, which in Britain involves having a cake and a cup of tea and talking to your neighbor for the first time in seven years. There was a concert at Buckingham Palace for one day. Buck Powell was the hippest place to be, and not just because of the number of hip replacements in action on the premises. I sat behind Granny as she tapped her feet and swayed along to the music. I had never loved her more to see her vibing with the crowd in this way. It seemed so unlike her. After all, I wasn't sure the performers were, exactly, how would one say, her cup of tea. Then I saw she was wearing an earpiece. What a genius. She'd found a way to join in the festivities while also maintaining her own private distance. What was she listening to, though? Later, I hunted down the courtier in charge of her musical choices and found out I was dumbfounded to discover one of the artists playing through her earpiece, Queen, had also been on the stage in front of her. Why had she chosen to listen to through her one phone, as the regal mp3 player was known in the palace? What was on the playlist for this wally septuagenarian queenster? Then I saw. She had only authorized artists who were members of the nobility, queen, prince, <laughs> Duke Ellington, Count Basie, Gladys Knight, Sir mix -a -Lot. I nodded, I smiled, I laughed aloud. God bless you, ma'am.